I have some new shirt and sticker designs on my shop linked below. On some of them, 100% of the profits go to charity, so check it out. The US Army's most substantial drone is the MQ-1C Grey Eagle, an Army-specific variant of the Air Force's retired Predator drone. Unlike the smaller RQ-7 Shadow employed in brigade combat teams and in Apache cavalry units, the Grey Eagle is suited for both recon and strike missions. It's capable of carrying up to four Hellfire missiles in its attack configuration, two in an attack recon configuration, or none if time in the air or other payloads are the priority. But drones don't actually need to be armed to bring about a target's destruction. Both the Grey Eagle and all Shadow V3s, two per Shadow V2 platoon, can use laser designators to guide in Hellfires fired from other aircraft. This means the unmanned Grey Eagle can do the risky business of spotting and maintaining contact with the enemy, while another Apache or Grey Eagle lets off a Hellfire. This can allow manned aircraft to remain concealed, and takes advantage of the Hellfire's max range to hopefully outrange enemy short-range air defenses. During counterinsurgency operations, it was noted how Grey Eagles could allow partnered Apaches to engage targets in dense urban terrain. Buildings and winding streets meant the Apaches couldn't necessarily see targets, so Grey Eagles could maintain a vantage point directly over an area. But in addition to just acquiring a target, Grey Eagles can help in positively identifying one. Because even if an Apache can detect something and recognize it as a vehicle, a UAV might be better positioned to differentiate between an enemy tank and a civilian semi-truck or friendly APC. The Apache even has the added benefit of being able to receive a live video feed directly from partnered UAVs, improving their situational awareness. Alternatively, if an Apache unit receives a call for fire from a ground unit, the Apaches can relay it to a Grey Eagle. The UAV can covertly engage from a high altitude and allow the Apaches to stay concealed. However, because the Grey Eagles normally fly at those higher altitudes, the airspace has to be deconflicted to avoid friendly fire by setting up a restricted operation zone or ROS. The ROS limits who can enter the airspace to who needs to be there, and is also something you'd see below an AC-130 firing its weapons. If you're familiar with ground warfare, cavalry or recce units can provide early warning of enemy activity to protect friendly forces. Same concept with UAVs. UAVs can be deployed forward, on the flanks, or to the rear of a flight of helicopters to provide it with aerial security. This increases the situational awareness and survivability of manned helicopters. But unlike an attack reconnaissance squadron, which has four shadow UAVs in each Apache troop, the Apache-equipped attack battalions have no UAVs of their own, so they have inferior recon capability unless Grey Eagles are attached or assigned in support from division. An example of a notional attack battalion task force could be a battalion headquarters company leading two attack companies, each with eight Apaches, an assault helicopter company with ten Blackhawks, a three-ship medevac platoon, four-ship Grey Eagle platoon, forward support company, and aviation maintenance company. But Grey Eagles can also support helicopter assaults or medevacs, providing security for manned helicopters by identifying targets, terrain, and signs of life. Grey Eagles can launch hours ahead of a main force to gather info about the target area and route. And with their superior endurance, Grey Eagles can extend the distance aviation can push out in front of a ground unit, increase the amount of time aviation remains in contact with the enemy, and allow commanders to preserve and mass manned aviation at a decisive point. To compare, Apaches have an average fuel endurance of about 2 hours, while a standard Grey Eagle can stay in the air for up to 22 hours and extended range upgrades increase endurance to up to 40 hours, which translates to a thousand kilometers round trip to target area and 14 hours of loiter time, although this is reduced when carrying two Hellfires. This lends unmanned aircraft to stealthy, slow, and deliberate reconnaissance tasks that minimize surprise contact with the enemy and require longer loiter times, while manned aircraft lend themselves to more rapid reconnaissance focused on a few key tasks and a forceful recon where aircraft are ready to engage the enemy. Close cooperation between UAVs and manned helicopters actually has a neat little doctrinal term, manned-unmanned teaming, or MUMT. 
This cooperation can be very close or more distant depending on the level of integration, known as levels of interoperability. The least close is level 1, where imagery and data is fed from the Grey Eagle to the ground controllers flying it, who then disseminate it to ground units. Level 2 is when the supported unit, such as an Apache or troops in contact, are fed imagery directly from the UAV, but the ground station retains control. Level 3 allows for an Apache crew to directly control the UAV's weapons payload and sensors. And level 4 allows for an Apache to directly control the UAV in its entirety with ground supervision, with the exception of takeoff and landing. Level 5 also includes takeoff and landing, but isn't currently done. The closest levels of interoperability are the ones that get the most attention online. The loyal wingman, completely controlled by manned aircraft, does have an appeal, but after talking to a soldier in an air cav unit, it seems more like a neat trick than a practical capability in most cases. Because an Apache crew already has a lot going on operating their own aircraft, directly controlling a second aircraft can easily lead to task overload. I've been told that it's more efficient for an Apache crew to direct a ground controller instead, which is sufficient most of the time. So level 2 or 3 is the norm for MUM-T integration. But Grey Eagle units can also maneuver independently to satisfy the division commander's recon and surveillance requirements, and in fact fly for the division most of the time. The difference between recon and surveillance is the former is active, focused on obtaining information on the enemy, terrain, or weather in a specific zone, area, or route, while surveillance is the passive observation of a given area. So for example, a UAV being sent forward to see if a road has any obstacles, signs of enemy troops, or unforeseen damage is reconnaissance, while continuously observing a possible avenue of enemy attack to make sure no one slips through is surveillance. As secondary missions, Grey Eagles can also conduct strikes, act as a communications relay for ground forces, or act as an air data relay for other aircraft. Grey Eagles can continuously loiter over an area of operations, which is a plus for the latter, but are also limited on firepower and the limited field of view of their sensors. Those issues can be mitigated, though, by unmanned teaming involving multiple UAVs. Multiple Grey Eagles can provide multiple sensors and more weapons on target, while still freeing up manned aircraft. Alternatively, unarmed and more expendable shadow UAVs could act as the hunter for a killer Grey Eagle. But the enemy does also get a vote. The Grey Eagle was ultimately introduced in the middle of a counterinsurgency and has been used mainly in uncontested airspace. They generally operate at higher altitudes, so are especially susceptible to medium and high altitude air defense. Although man-portable air defense systems or man-pads are less of a threat at a service ceiling of 25,000 feet, part of the point of more capable air defense systems is to deny those higher altitudes. The road ahead in that regard is more capable avionics and ordnance. Rather than relying on video cameras to acquire targets, it's possible to use a synthetic aperture radar to spot military targets from 75 kilometers away. As far as striking targets, the Grey Eagle Extended Range Upgrade has been tested with GBU-69 small glide munitions that extends the Grey Eagle strike range from 8 to 32 kilometers. As well, small air-launched drones called air-launched effects may also be on the menu for the Extended Range version to further extend its vision into hostile airspace. They could also act as jammers, decoys, or weapons themselves to expand the usefulness of the Grey Eagle. These features combined could allow the Grey Eagle to stay out of range of most of Russia's maneuver unit air defense systems, like Manpads, Strela 10, or Tor M2. They'd still be vulnerable to fighter aircraft and strategic air defense systems like the S-400, which are more for protecting key infrastructure than maneuver units. But one has to wonder whether a Russia-type opponent actively suppressed by the US Air Force and saturated with higher-value aircraft would have the luxury of spending its most capable SAMs on Grey Eagles. Still, the war in Ukraine shows that attrition rates for fixed-wing, long-endurance UAVs like Bayraktar are high in large-scale conflict, and they need permissive conditions to do their missions effectively. Although, one would hope America's three fixed-wing air forces are more capable of creating favorable conditions than Ukrainian air forces. 
But in addition to the survivability of the aircraft itself, the survivability of the ground control station and data link are also issues for drones in general. The current conflict has also shown that ground control stations can be targeted and destroyed by artillery. To counter this threat, part of the upgrades will include the ability to be controlled via multiple satellite constellations. This is meant to allow for uninterrupted flight and ground operators to be well beyond the line of sight. Aside from enemy threats, there are other limitations. The Grey Eagle requires a 4500 by 100 foot improved runway, which is about 1.4 kilometers long. This compares to older versions of the Shadow, which could launch from a catapult and land on a 710 foot or 216 meter unimproved runway. Although I'm told that V2 and V3 Shadows require some hardness. This means a Grey Eagle company might have to be geographically separate from the rest of the Aviation Brigade, which is mostly helicopters that don't need runways. That requires more robust logistics and communications to integrate the Grey Eagles into ops. But what do Grey Eagle units actually look like? Grey Eagles are held in 15 UAS or Unmanned Aerial System companies. 11 are part of combat aviation brigades in each active duty division excluding the new 11th Airborne. Although the 25th Infantry Division's Grey Eagle Company is stationed at Fort Wainwright in Alaska and attached to the 11th. Two are part of the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment and two are part of the 116th Military Intelligence Brigade known as the Aerial Exploitation Brigade. As of 2019, there were also 11 training aircraft and 13 float aircraft for a total of 204 in the fleet. When deployed, each company operates one Grey Eagle system that includes 12 MQ-1C aircraft, 6 ground control stations, and other systems for passing data and auto landing the aircraft. These systems are distributed amongst three flight platoons capable of operating independently from different airstrips. Companies part of the U.S. Army Special Operations Command and Intelligence and Security Command also have a fourth platoon of people but no UAVs. This allows for more launch sites. Divisional Grey Eagle companies can support up to two separate launch sites, while Echelon Above Division companies can support three. Each platoon has an HQ, ground control section, and launch and recovery section. They're led by a Chief Warrant Officer 3, who's a subject matter expert in unmanned aircraft systems. They're assisted by a Sergeant First Class as Platoon Sergeant. The ground control section consists of a UAS operations technician, ranking Chief Warrant Officer 2, and eight enlisted Grey Eagle operators. Unlike a helicopter unit where the pilots are all warrant officers or commissioned officers, UAV operators in the Army are enlisted soldiers, so even a specialist can command authority when it comes to piloting a UAV. At least one, a sergeant on paper, is specifically qualified and designated as an instructor operator that trains and evaluates the other crew members. Another, nominally a staff sergeant, is designated as the MQ-1 sergeant. These operators have to take shifts in order to ensure they get enough rest in between missions, and take more rest if the unit conducts surge operations. During normal operations, divisional companies can have three aircraft in the air continuously when operating from two launch and recovery sites, or four when the company is consolidated at a single site. But during surge operations, the Grey Eagle Company can generate up to five missions a day with split basing, or six missions a day if consolidated. But this is less sustainable over time, and operators need a day's rest after surging. At least two operators are required for most missions, with the exception of when the UAV is acting as a data relay for other aircraft. Meanwhile, the launch and recovery section consists of an instructor operator, nominally a staff sergeant, and five other MQ-1 operators. Both sections have a truck-mounted ground control station, and the launch and recovery section has automatic takeoff and landing systems that allow Grey Eagles to launch and recover without operator interaction. The drones themselves are held in a UAS maintenance platoon, which includes an HQ and three maintenance sections. The platoon is led by an aviation maintenance technician, while each eight-man section is led by a staff sergeant. Each section has two large semi-trailer flatbeds for transporting the four UAVs, which can be disassembled and transported in compact crates. 
The platoon also in theory has an aviation maintenance augmentation team with Grey Eagle repairers and two aircraft structural repairers. The difference is MQ-1 repairers are focused on their specific aircraft systems and related hardware like the ground control systems while aircraft structural repairers fabricate new parts if the airframe itself is damaged. Although I'm told in reality, the Grey Eagle relies on General Atomics Field Service representatives or FSRs to work on the airframe, and the 15 Gulfs referenced in the MTO don't actually work on Grey Eagle airframes. At the company level, there's an automotive maintenance section for maintaining the ground vehicles in the unit. For the most part, it consists of wheeled vehicle and engine mechanics. A class 3 and 5 section supplies the company with fuel and ammunition, including among other things, two Hemet fuel tankers, two Atlas all-terrain forklifts, two semi-trailers, and two Hemet trucks with trailers. And lastly, there's the company headquarters and flight operations section. The former is only somewhat different from any other company HQ, including the commander ranking major as opposed to the typical captain executive officer ranking captain as opposed to a lieutenant, a first sergeant, supply sergeant, signal NCO, Seaburn NCO, medic, and supply specialist. The flight operations section does some of the jobs of a battalion HQ. The section does day-to-day flight-related activities like coordinating airspace, maintaining air crew records, mission planning, and managing flight schedules. Other aviation companies don't typically have this element as part of their MTO, as Grey Eagle companies are organizationally independent of any battalion. A flight operations officer will do things like brief the commander on the unit's flying capabilities, aircraft availability, and the status of the crews. So what are the key points to remember? The main job of the Grey Eagle is to conduct reconnaissance, surveillance, and target acquisition missions. It can also do armed reconnaissance and conduct its own strike missions. However, carrying Hellfire missiles reduces the time it can spend in the air significantly, and it's less well-armed and survivable than an Apache attack helicopter. But UAVs and helicopters can employ MUM-T to make forces more survivable and flexible overall. Other non-combat roles for the Grey Eagle include acting as a communications relay for ground forces or as an air data relay for other aircraft. Grey Eagles are known to be vulnerable during high-intensity conflicts, and the intended solution is increasing the standoff range of the aircraft to limit their susceptibility to air defenses. If you like content on modern militaries, check out this video on Ukraine's armored raid behind enemy lines to free thousands of trapped troops in 2014. We'll see you over there.